This is Tanner Massey, and you are watching the Permanent Rain Press. Hi, everyone. It's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press today. I'm happy to be joined by Tanner Massey. How's it going? It is going great. Thank I'm you happy to hear that. Uh, I know it's been a crazy ride for you recently. You've been kind of watching yourself back on The Voice season 24, and I'm excited to dive into your journey on the show so far. But first off, what can you share about your background in the arts and when you knew you had a love for performing? So I've been singing for a good amount of years, um, possibly around seven to eight years of my life. I started just as just an amateur like singer singing for different talent shows at my school. Um, and I slowly grew a passion for music just in general. Um, I would listen to music while doing pretty much anything. And I never really had a social life at all um, until basically this year. So I always just took music as like my main thing, the thing that I would probably be doing for the rest of my life. And it basically took the place of any friends that I might have had growing up. So I've taken music really seriously. I've grown passion for all kinds of different music genres. And here I am today on The Voice. You were homeschooled, right? Correct. Yes, I was homeschooled. And then I know you've been kind of writing, making music more seriously um, for the past five years or so. Yes, I've been doing a lot of different stuff when it comes to production. Um, I've been like learning different tools like Pro Tools and FL Studio, just basically learning how to potentially produce my own music and help other producers so I can like describe my sound to other producers, that kind of thing. I always thought that might help. And songwriting, which is something I've always kind of dipped my feet into, but more recently I've been actually um, going about it because I actually got a little note from Gwen Stefani that I should be songwriting a lot. So I've been taking that more seriously. It's always good to kind of broaden um, your knowledge. And then obviously the technical side as well is something that can only benefit you as an artist. You grew up in Oklahoma City. You mentioned, you know, performing locally. How has your town and community shaped you and supported your growth? So a lot of my, a lot of my growth and everything has come from doing getting different opportunities to perform at places in Oklahoma. Um, there's been many different Opry's. There's been many different little like areas I've been able to perform for. I've got this place called the Chester's party barn that I've always performed for since I was really little. Um, Rodeo Opry, the McSwain theater, which is actually, was actually one of the places that, um, Reba on the voice had actually performed at before. And I've just gotten so many different opportunities uh, in Oklahoma locally, that it's really helped me get more comfortable on stage. I would not have been able to do like step on even on that stage, let alone be the nervous wreck I was for the blind auditions um, if I had not had that experience prior. So lots of different reasons that I became a singer and had all this experience growing up and a lot of help and support from my local musicians. You know, you mentioned all these different experiences you've been a part of. That includes Acapop Kids. You did a couple of covers with them. What did you take away from your time as part of this group? Being on Acapop Kids was really cool. It was basically my first taste of like being able to sing with a bunch of really cool people that were actually kind of my age at that point. I think I was like, the, I, I recall being like one of the oldest people on Acapop Kids, though. So I can't really say that. But um, no, it was a great time. There were so many insanely talented people on Acapop Kids. And being able to sing with them was definitely an experience that took me beyond just singing locally with, you know, kind of country side more people um, whenever I was usually more on the pop side. So it definitely broadened like my horizons and opened my eyes that, oh, yes, I am in Oklahoma still and a lot of it is country, but I forget that there is a whole world of other people just like me um, that are sharing my same music interests, interests, that's not a word, interests. And yeah, I, it was a great time. You were a soloist in their popular rendition of Shallow. I know you filmed that at such a beautiful venue. It was the White Sparrow Barn in Texas. So was that something cool kind of filming that? Like it's essentially a music video. 
it was really cool. And yes, it, it pretty much was a music video. Yeah. And I remember we would get to run. And this is the thing is I have a really awkward run. I get I didn't even realize this. But like in that shallow music video, we were supposed to run out of the barn. And I don't know, every time I watch that part back, I'm just like, man, my run looks really goofy. <laughs> it's like it the like one I, thing you can't look at. You're like, I can't watch that portion of the video. It's not just that. I also just look so weirdly tall too. Not like in a good way, like lanky tall. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> but no, it was so much fun. Um, they really put their heart and soul into that project. And it was so much fun. I can't, I can't, even, I can't even describe it. And then around the same time, you were also a part of Music Cash season one, further getting the opportunity to kind of grow as an artist, learn about the industry. How was that experience? You really do know the, know your stuff, don't you? <laughs> yeah, um, Music Cash was a really, really cool uh, experience. I got to meet, a, that was probably the first time that I ever went out to LA for something that was like specifically singing related, like specifically singing. I had gone out there for acting, I think at, around that time, but that was the first time that I was there for something that was like based on like a talent show kind of thing. Um, Music Cash was really cool. I got to meet a lot of awesome people that I still know to this day. From Music Cash, I got like in the top 12, something like that. And um, they actually, I actually was signed as part of their, as part of their label. Um, a bunch of that over time kind of fell through eventually, but it gave me a lot of new cool experiences and it really put me, it really sent me a lot of other directions. Cause I, from that, I met so many other like cool people in the industry uh, that I ended up talking to. And yeah. What's really interesting with that is you go from Acapop kids where you're like one of the oldest. And then I think music hash, you were one of the youngest kind of competitors. So it's kind of like, there was not a, a scenario where everyone was like the same age as you, but you're getting to like meet a lot of people that are passionate about music. Like you said, you didn't really get that experience growing up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to be fair, I've gotten, I, I don't sometimes realize it because to me, after a while, it becomes kind of normal, but I have, I guess, had a, quite a few interesting experiences uh, in my life, especially when it relates to music. Um, and yeah, being the youngest on Music Cash, I didn't even realize that. Is that true? I felt, I guess it was. I, what, was I like 15, 16? I don't remember those days at this point. It feels like a year. It was years ago. It feels like a lifetime ago. But yeah, yeah. Um, it is, it is pretty funny. You do play guitar, a bit of the piano. We haven't seen that on The Voice yet, but how long have you been playing these instruments for? I've been playing guitar for years. Um, I've grown pretty comfortable with playing and singing at the same time. For piano, I've always kept that on the down low because I am not good at it yet. But at the same time, I feel like piano, I feel like I should be good at piano, but I just haven't had enough time to put enough, like enough training and everything into it um so i would love that another thing that i definitely need to pick up that i 100 percent swear to everybody i will pick up eventually is drums because i drum a lot if anyone knows me they know that i drum like crazy and it's everybody always asks me if i play drums and i always tell them i technically don't but i really should um so there's that but yes guitar I love playing and singing. It's one of my favorite things to do. I just sit in my room and I don't think people realize how many covers I have that I've never posted of just me playing guitar in my room singing. And because I'm way too self-conscious, I'll never actually post them. So, yeah. So but, your phone is full of like archived videos that you never posted on TikTok. I probably have four times the amount of videos and stuff of me singing on my phone and videos of me singing than will ever be posted <laughs> on Instagram or anything like that. I guess it's hard for you because it's kind of like, you know, you film them, they sit around, maybe you're not 100% sure. And then like, you know, the next new song comes out, you're covering that. And so it kind of just gets it. It gets hidden and pushed away but I'm sure sometimes it might be nice to revisit them see your growth oh 100 percent, and I do that a lot actually um I'll listen to like an old cover and what's interesting about it is is that whenever I record covers 
uh, whenever I record covers, I will record them like 30 times. Cause like whenever I'm actually serious about getting one out, I'll record them like 30 times and I'll never get one that I actually want until like the very end where I'm really tired and broken down. I'll record it and I'll be like, yes, that was perfect. Like, th but this is the thing here is your ear is fatigued and you don't, you, you might not realize it, but your ear from listening to the same song and singing the same song over and over and over and over and over again. This is something I learned is you start to like think things that are bad are actually good. And you got to realize that's not the way it is. So then I'll post it that night or I'll like post it during the day or something like that after multiple takes. And then I'll be like the next day I'll wake up. That sucked. Why did I post that? <laughs> that is exactly what will happen. But then two years later, I'll listen to my old covers and I'll be like, oh, those are actually way better than I thought they would be. I was listening to old stuff thinking, you know, oh, how far have I come? And I'll be like, okay, actually, that wasn't that bad, which is nice to know that, you know, not all my stuff sucked back then, but. <laughs> Trust the process is the lesson then. Basically, don't don't make rash decisions. But that's funny, like what you said about you kind of tune it out eventually when you've heard the same song many, many times. Um, you do have a trio of original singles out that you released last year. And I love how they kind of differ in sound, but they have this recurring alternative theatrical pop theme. Uh, in the past, you have cited Fall Out Boy, Panic at the Disco, Imagine Dragons as some of your big inspirations. So how have these artists really influenced you? Those have been some of the main ones that have influenced me generally. I mean, there are so many now, like I can't even count. Um, from anything from like Hozier, Noah Khan, to just like some of the ones that you'll hear like on the voice, like Niall Horan. Um, but I would say that those specific genres influenced me because one, I was a teenager and teenagers listened to Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy on repeat. But I don't know. It, I, it's easy to say that, but at the same time, there there really was a connection for me with like songs written by um by like bands in that kind of 2000s to 2010s period um i really really love that sound there's like a soulful element to it but then there's like a there, there's so many cool things that they're doing in those songs and i think the main thing is like just amazing vocalists Haley williams brendan Uri, patrick stump absolutely incredible vocalists and i always i always wanted to kind of be like them I always wanted to have these big this big sound um already a big sound from the band coupled with you know really really good vocals that's always been one of my things that I've always just loved to do I like the idea of having a song where there's just so much going on but it feels controlled and it feels like just really powerful you know what I mean um that's kind of why rock is one of my favorite genres and probably is my favorite genre but I can't throw a favorite out there or else I'll hate myself in three days. So coming back yeah. to it and being like, oh, why did I say rock was my favorite? But <laughs> exactly. I, I think that's great because, you know, any genres now, there's a lot of like mixing that you can do with them. And so like with rock, it's it's fun, but it can also have that emotional and that heavy side. Um, Ate My Party was my favorite release <laughs> of yours last year, which was your favorite release of yours in 2022. I think Ain't My Party was also mine. Um, it's, it's tough to say that one was a, that one was a, sorry, <laughs> I don't know where this cough is coming from. It's out of absolutely nowhere. Um, I think Ain't My Party was my favorite because it just had such a, like, kind of depressing-ish element almost to it, but it, it had like a kind of beautiful element too. I, I, re I really, I really did like those. Um, I do, I will say this, however, I will definitely be releasing more music very, very soon. I will say that um, because I, as much as I love those songs, I definitely think I could improve and go further and beyond because a lot of those songs were actually originally demos for, for another project I was actually doing at the time. <coughs> Where is this coming from? Absolutely nowhere. I, like I haven't coughed a single a time today. A cup of water or something. Are you good? Actually, I do have water here. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> would you say then like you are still finding your sound as an artist and like what you want to say as a songwriter, like on the writing side, what have you been influenced by over the past year? 
over the past year, I've been especially influenced by um, Noah Khan, I would say, especially recently. Uh, I only found out about Noah Khan actually in LA recently. Um, I listened to like Six Season. I listened to a bunch of different ones that he released on like his, some of his older albums too, uh, like off Busy Head. But I would say that he's been a big influence for me, Hozier. And as weird as it sounds, like I, I've listened to a lot of like J-Rock. I've listened to a lot of like ice, Icelandic stuff. Like th there's there's so many different influences that I've gained over the years. Like there's a band named, uh, I don't I actually never knew if I'm saying their name right. I've always said Calio, but I actually heard from some people it's Kaleo recently. So I'm like, oh shoot, have I, have I been saying that wrong this whole time? But they they do so such an incredible job of mixing rock like with this either sarcastical element or like these like really cool tones and just songs in general that are about things that I would never think for people to write songs about. Um, and they just, they, they are absolutely incredible. And one of the coolest things about them is they perform live in the craziest places. They, they perform their song Skinny in a literal active volcano. Like you can see the lava in the background. Another one they performed on an iceberg that's melt that was melting beneath them. I'm just like, okay, okay. And they did it live. It's crazy. But um, no, they're, they've been, been especially one of my biggest influences songwriting wise. Is that the um, aspiration or goal for you to sing in <laughs> extreme places? I, I would say so, but I don't know if I could actually do that. I, yeah, I, I hate cold. So I couldn't do that, but maybe near a volcano, if I uh, don't, if I don't cower away from that idea. Maybe put it on the bucket list, maybe give it some thought before you, you write that down. Um, but we'll talk yeah. about The Voice, season 24, the next step in your career. How did you end up as a contestant on the show? Like, were you recruited? Yes, um, they did actually reach out to me, but I did still go through the audition process and everything. So like to actually get into it, I heard some people have been through that audition process like six, seven, eight times. It's crazy. Um, so the, the fact that I was able to get on was amazing. I've actually auditioned for it before as well, um, for a few different ones, actually. But, but the fact that I was actually able to get on for this season was a miracle. Um, and this season, like, I, I don't want to say nothing, but I mean, I, I'll say this. I think this season has been a, like an incredible season. Um, like so many insanely talented singers. I am absolutely baffled by how they found these gems um of people as well and I'll, I'll get into that later i guess whenever i get into that but it i'm very thankful for uh for the chance i've been given here so in the past when you said you auditioned did you just like submit a tape and not hear back yeah pretty much i i, I may be recalling incorrectly um it might have been for an, for like a whole other thing but i i do believe that i got like there's like phases to it. I think you, you like perform for different producers and everything. And then you see where you can go in that. And I think I got to a certain level in that. And then there, I, you just get ghosted. <laughs> but, You're like, yeah. you just never hear from them again, but Hey, this time it seems to have worked out really well. You clearly made it through, <clears throat> through some good rounds to actually make it on the show, get a coach. I'm curious who have been some of your favorite contestants from the voice over the years. That is a question that I am going to go on hours for. I will say this though. I think Mac Royals has been probably my, one of my all around favorites. Um, just something about his voice, man. Like he's, we were, we were like in a room a while ago. I mean, literally at the beginning of blinds, he sang for us like di these different songs. Uh, while Eli, Eli Ward, he was playing guitar and the dude just has the most authentic R&B sound I've ever heard. It is just incredible what he does on stage and everything. And the confidence he exudes too is just really cool to me. Um, so I would say Mac Rolls is probably one of my favorites. I, I again, could go on for hours. I love Chechi. I love Lennon. I love Huntley. There, 
again, I, I will say this, this question is, is really tough. Um, but yes, I want to say every single person on the competition, but I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and put a three, three of my favorites. I would say three of my favorites are, are Mac Royals, Lennon and Alexa Huntley, everybody. It's <laughs> like throw in that casual everybody at the end. Yeah. And but, everybody. I mean, you're talking about like this season, but you have, like tuned into a lot of like the past seasons as well yeah i've well i've mainly been listening to them on youtube to be honest with you um and i heard so many crazy people on the show that i am like how am i this far on the show <laughs> but um no i i especially listened to the last season last season was amazing riley tate has become one of my absolute favorite people to listen to sing at all um he's just an absolutely incredible singer who has and I, I saw Niall say this um on some sort of podcast or interview he had but he he said that Riley Tate has something that like people in their 30s do not have in his voice in his artistry whatever and that could not be put any better that that and I sometimes forget he's he's pretty much a kid still it's crazy what he can do. So he was probably my favorite artist from the last season. That or Noivis or somebody. Ah, oh, so many again. I don't want to say again. What's really cool is, I guess, to also see the potential that they have and, like, the ceiling is just so high for, for these artists on the show. Uh, now, in your audition, in your blind audition, you're halfway through before you go. No chair turn. What is running through your mind? I'm not going to lie to you. A lot of people probably thought that I was, like, like, please, somebody turn in my head. That was not actually going through my mind. At that point, you were just pure focused on the song. And you're not even like when Re when Reba turned, I remember, I remember knowing Reba turned mentally. I don't know if I like processed it exactly, but I knew I I acknowledged somewhere that she turned. Um, but even then, my brain was just so hyper focused on the song. And this is kind of how I was with my knockout recently. I I the one thing I've learned on the voice is to just get lost in the song, like to stay focused, but really just get lost in what you're doing. And that is kind of like what it's really about. It's not about, it's not entirely about at least um, your situation or like what's going on around you, or you need to get a chair turn or anything. It's really just about the emotion of the song. It's about what you're trying to portray. And just feeling that is something that I've kind of learned is how I want to do my music generally so you mentioned Reba turns you know she gives you the sweetest smile your parents are just so excited what has it been for you for you know all your performances watching them back on tv and seeing the coach's reaction in real time to you singing because like you mentioned you're really just getting lost in the song so you're not necessarily seeing their reactions and playing into it at all I love this question I, I love all these questions um so yeah, watching them back with my family and everything has been really, really weird and bizarre. I feel like I'm watching a different person whenever I'm on stage. I'm not going to lie to you. That is definitely how it feels. Partially, that's probably because, you know, they have all the TV editing and you're watching it in like 4K. And I'm just like, wow, I did. I said all those things. And I think I black out a lot of the times that I do interviews like on the show because they'll do like reality interviews right you know and i'm i'm just like why did i say those things that th that's so embarrassing i hate that <laughs> a lot of answers i'll give i'll be like way too excited and i'm probably still doing that here to be honest with you and i just don't realize it but um i'll give like way too excited they'll ask me so what's it like being on the voice and i'll be like oh my gosh it's just so incredible and like so amazing literally and it's incredible I'll say like the same things over and over again. I think I said the word incredible five billion times, but yeah, um, it is really, really weird. It's like, it's really meta to see myself on the, on the TV for sure. I wanted to talk about the battles that you and Lennon did. You've become best friends, even though you were competitors in that moment. Tell me about your friendship and what you bonded over. Okay, so me and Lennon bonded over quite a few different things. Um, but I would say one thing is just the energy and like the passion we put into the song. 
I kind of, we, we kind of had to find that at first. We did not exactly, we were not super compatible at first because we just didn't really understand what to do with the song. Because when you're put with a battle song, the first thing your brain thinks is, okay, so how do I stand out? And that was the first thought initially, I think for both of us. But I think over time, like whenever we were just rehearsing the song, we realized that we have to do, we have to perform the song in a way that makes sense. It has to make sense for this song. I can't just be like doing a bunch of riffs or something like that. And then, you know, Lennon gets up there and does his incredible high falsetto godly thing. And just, so over time we realized there's like a certain level. There's like a certain level the song has to be at. And, you know, obviously we can play off of each other in the song and everything, but what we really bonded over was finding that because we, we, we connected with that through basically emotions for the most part. Uh, we told each other a bunch of secrets and stuff, secrets that I will never spill to the day I die. And we basically just became friends. We hung out, did a bunch of stuff. I met his friend group because at the voice, there's multiple different friend groups that usually form. And uh, it, it was just a great time. I could not. And I, I mean this genuinely. I don't, I could not have asked for a better battles partner, like in the entire show, I don't think. Um, because he, he just, he just showed me so many different perspectives and stuff just whenever it comes to music in general and his music taste is incredible. Yeah. I go on forever. Love that dude. <laughs> it's so nice when you can be vulnerable with each other. Like you mentioned, that's what you really bonded over, um, which is kind of through that process of, of, arranging the song and how you wanted to sing it so were you given that song like you and Lennon didn't choose that song believe it or not no we do not choose we do not none of us choose the song in battle um it is the coaches that choose the songs for us so we I didn't even know the song Lennon knew the song apparently he had performed it before like some sometime maybe but not really um was that an immediate like initial nervous energy from you knowing that okay you don't even know the song at all and Lennon has performed it oh yeah absolutely I did not know who I was going to get for my battle pairing I, I I had a bunch of speculation I was just praying that I didn't get a few certain people but um no Lennon was and and I say I say this weirdly because this is just not how I felt really at the time he was like he was like a really 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 good singer but at the same time the part of it that my brain like connected to most was just being able to sing with him so I felt like I was just more lucky than anything to just be able to like be his battle partner even though he was he's just incredible and he, nobody would want to actually go against him <laughs> you talk a lot about the cast of love you've grown close with a lot of them um, like Laura Grant Eli you mentioned take me behind the scenes and how you connect with each other off screen uh, jam sessions. That's the way that you do that. Um, you jam. One person plays guitar or two people and then three and then four and then five people play guitar. And then you just have these tons of people singing and harmonizing. And it's just, it's like a music summer camp, but with like some of the most talented singers you'll ever listen to. And um, that was one way. Another way is just afterwards, after you guys have heard each other sing, you're just, you're just hanging out. You go down to the pool, you go down to like, ah, oh man, such a good time. <laughs> you go down to like Starbucks or something like that. I never went to Starbucks, but you know, some of my friends did. And um, you just hang out, you write songs. That's another way we did it. Uh, we would write a lot of songs together. That's basically it. Just like any friends you would have, to be honest with you. And um, yeah, we, we get in like, we're still in, group chats and stuff like that and we still talk done I was gonna say when you're kind of um I guess filming in California you're shuttled back and forth together you're kind of quarantined in like hotels together so it's kind of impossible for you not to like have these run-ins and make those connections is it easy to put the competition aspect aside or is that kind of something that's always you know a bit weighing on the back of the mind 
That's an interesting question. And the answer is absolutely, I think most people forget about the competition until it's time to go. Um, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm just the one that did this, but I don't think I am. Um, I think a lot of people did this. And I think it's easy to forget what you're actually doing. You're out there for a while. And there's so many people that they can't get around to every single person's like rehearsal or everything you're doing um, at the same time. So you're out there for a while and you have a lot of like days of, you know, resting or just hanging with people and stuff like that. So I think a lot of people did kind of not see it as a competition as much. I know I've, I've always seen this as a competition, of course, but at the same time, it's always just been a big opportunity for me to, you know, perform in front of a lot of people and, you know, try to make the best of learning and understanding um, so many different perspectives that I've gotten. And honestly, the learning part of it has been one of the most important things I'll ever take away from this entire journey. Um, that That is priceless from this. But yeah, I would say absolutely people do forget because you're having a lot of fun and sometimes you will forget that. It is a competition. <laughs> I think that that's the healthiest mindset, though, that you can have, you know, going into let's reality competition show like this. Um, but you can see on stage how like encouraging everyone is of one another. Oh, 100 percent. Like a lot of people might think that there's a lot of, you know, tension or something like that. I don't get that at all. Never. And if there is that, then I understand it and respect it. But I will never I will never like look at somebody differently because of maybe the way they sing or maybe because I, you know, oh, I think I can beat them or something like that. No, it's, it's never that. And that's never mentioned. Um, maybe with some other groups, but I never heard anything like that, at least. Yeah. I think it's, it's good to say that, you know, everyone's experience is they're going through their own thing, but that's never been your experience on the show. Um, in the knockouts, you battled against Chechi and Rudy. What was it like for you going up against these two amazing vocalists? Like when you found out that you'd be going up against them, like what were those initial thoughts? So <laughs> there's a few things that happened behind the scenes that are like really funny to me, but I don't want to mention them. <laughs> But basically, it was hearing I was against both of them, um, terrifying. Now, here's the thing. I kind of, I, I, it's kind of an advantage that I stand out as a guy singer among the three, which you could technically argue is some sort of advantage um, because there's actually not that many guy singers in the competition, not as many as girls, at least. Um, so you kind of end up standing out a little bit more because of that. But at the same time, it's Chechi and Rudy, and they're both four chair turns for one, but I never have attributed that to necessarily going further in the competition exactly. Um, but it is still terrifying because I know the way they sing. I was literally right after Chechi in blinds. It probably doesn't show that in, in the actual like voice thing, but I, I, I was actually right after her. I got to listen to her sing. My parents did too. Yeah, terrifying. Um, Rudy, I never really got to hear her sing very much. And then whenever I did, I was like, oh, okay, sure. All right. Yeah, this is fair. Um, it was, it was pretty terrifying. I'm not going to lie. So I basically, up until I went up on stage, I was pretty in my own head about the whole thing. I was pretty much like, eh, I'm probably going to go home. It's fine though. Honestly, that's how I was for the most part. And then whenever I got up on stage, for some reason, I felt a lot of confidence and I don't know why. I really, do, I still don't exactly know why I felt so much confidence, but I walked up onto the stage and sang my song and it just, something about it felt right in the moment. And I, I, I can't put my finger on why, um, but I think I was kind of accepting of whether I was going to go home or not. I think I was accepting with going home as long as I just gave it my best performance. And that song meant a lot to me. So I just kind of put everything into that and packed my bag in my head basically. I think that that's kind of all you can do in that situation. You know, you go first, you do what you can, then you kind of have to sit there and hear the others sing, knowing it's out of your hands. But, um, you know, that song was such a good 
cho choice for you um when you hit the like i need somebody now part it was like next level you had john legend standing up um you got so many compliments at the end and you were genuinely surprised to win it looked like very much so well you have to understand for one i really didn't see any of that going on in the chairs um i didn't see any of that i don't recall seeing any of that you have the crowd cheering for you of course but like it's expected you know what i mean it's kind of expected that they're you know supposed to cheer at certain points in the song maybe so i was like okay yeah that's this is normal i'm just giving it my all but at the same time for this one specifically something felt really right about it and i don't know what it was but it something something about it just felt really right and i was again just lost in the song i was in my emotions a little bit and my emotions are weird whenever it comes to singing because it's not like crying emotions or anything it's just it's just like a weird serious side of me that i only show when i sing <clears throat> so i basically just got lost in that again and waited to see what happened and yeah i was shocked for a very good reason chechi being one of the most insane singers i've ever heard in my life her whistle um, tone <laughs> like is that something you can only like belt. aspire to <laughs> Her have you ever tried beat? a whistle tone? No, I no, I have never tried a whistle tone, nor will I ever attempt to do a whistle. Actually, maybe I will attempt to do a whistle tone. But like for for Ruby, for example, okay, Ruby on the show, she did the yodeling, and I was like, wow, that's really cool. I gotta try that. And then whenever I heard Chechi do her whistle tone, I'm like, wow, that's really cool. I'm not gonna try that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just one of those things that I don't hear many guys doing um at all if any especially for the voice good luck but uh, yeah you mentioned kind of blacking out sometimes you know when you maybe hear hear comments so john legend said you were his favorite niall also said he would have um gone for you when he turned to gwen um did, did those comments register in real time oh yeah absolutely so all so from from what i remember it was all three of the coaches were like saying that I, that I, that, that they favored me. And that was really weird because I, I was like, did nobody hear? Cause I don't know if you guys saw me, if, the, if any, if anyone saw me watching TV, um, my dog just came in here. <laughs> he might just be our buddy in the background for a little bit. Um, but during like Rudy's, I was just in the background. She was singing Smoking Out the Window. I'm just like, must have spent 35, 45,000. Nothing. I was literally doing like the background vocals. Oh, no. You know what I mean? I was literally just singing along to it. It was so good. Rudy is incredible. And then obviously Chechi is just Chechi. So, yeah. I, I don't I, think I, it showed that. It would have been funny to see you basically like at a Rudy concert in the past. I know, but I, I think they didn't show that for a good reason. <laughs> I think I might have done it too much. I didn't even realize I wasn't trying. I don't try to do this. I don't, I'm not trying to like, I wasn't trying to like stand out or anything. I was just, I was, I really enjoyed it. And because I'm on like the part of the stage where I can hear it the best. Um, I can hear like everything going on really well. Uh, Cause all the monitors are going and she did amazing. So I was just dancing along to it and I was like, Oh shoot, I'm on TV. And yeah. You gave Niall two shout outs um, before you left the stage. I think you were like, I still love you, Niall. <laughs> Why was it important for you to add that in? It was very important. So after, um, after me and Lennon's battle, Niall sent me an email basically telling me like, basically telling me like it's such a hard choice man I, I i hope that you don't hate me for the choice that i made and i i had to i had to i had to give him a little bit of like a little bit of love on stage because i do think niall is an absolutely incredible coach uh, undoubtedly he's such a genuine dude like you would not you would not expect someone of his level of fame to just be such like a nice and genuine dude but he really is and yeah, he really he really does care. So I, I love that guy. Love that man. Love him. On the kind of note of coaches, because you've been on two teams now with Niall and Gwen, what is one specific lesson or takeaway that you've learned from each of them? So from Niles, it was originally just basically really the emotional side, I think, of it. 
And that was, that was really what originally got me going into like battles with this completely different vibe than I had in blinds where it sounded like me desperately trying to get somebody to turn with my voice. And then in battles, it's, this is just my opinion. Uh, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out. I, I feel like there was a lot more level of artistry there, like a lot more tamed and controlled basically. And that's kind of what I learned on Niall's team. And then on Gwen's team, Gwen had this absolutely like, I would say m- almost motherly kind of coaching experience to her where she was very, she was very, very like kind of freeing. She kind of let me do what I wanted to. And um, she just, she just inspired me to do a bunch of things. Like she, she told me about like songwriting and how I kind of, what I was talking about earlier, where I get lost into the music and she's helped me a lot with just kind of confidence because I remember, I remember what she told Eli, one of my, one of my best friends. Um, she told him whenever it was like talking about confidence and stuff, she's like, what I, what I think to myself is I am mother effing Gwen Stefani and I get out there and I kill the song. Like that's, that's how I run confidence. And I'm like, yeah, that's fair enough. You kind of have to take those words to heart when it's Gwen Stefani <laughs> saying them. Oh yeah. 100%. And I'm like, oh yeah. If I could just be Gwen Stefani, you know, that'd be nice. <laughs> just um, trade in your own identity. You're like, that would be, that would be great. And I feel like you'd learn so much. And yeah, just with her wealth of knowledge, performance aspect as well as a big thing. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where I got like more of the performance edge um, whenever it came to, whenever it came to knockouts, especially. Is there a song that you've covered in the past that you would like to revisit on the show? There is a lot of those. Um, although it's really tough to decide I would say probably a song like Stop and Stare by One Republic. Um, just, ooh, if I could sing that one, ooh, ooh, I would, mm. I might actually cry on stage if I get to sing that one. Um, another one is like Who Did That to You by John Legend, his his version of it anyways. Whew. I don't know why I sing this song. Like, I, I don't usually say I sing a song well because – it singers don't really say that very much it, from my experience, but for some weird reason, I actually really gel well with that song. It's got this cool, um, soulful tone to it. And that is, that's a side that I haven't really been able to show very much yet on the voice is like the soulful kind of dark kind of sound to me, almost like Nini's, but not Nini because Nini is Nini and no one's singing like Nini. Like most people on the planet aren't singing like Nini. But it's kind of like that vibe, what she was saying, like dark pop. Uh, I love that term because it kind of makes sense to me. You would not be nervous singing like his song in front of him. Everybody has always said that. For me, that's never been a thing to me, though. I don't know why. Like, I I don't really. Maybe there's an aspect of it I'm not getting. But I feel like that's kind of a plus. I get that if you don't do it as well as them, if, you know, you go up there and you kind of you know don't do very well but I don't know I feel like that'd be really cool to me because like I I don't get the impression that they're going to be mean about it that they're going to be like oh you sang my song you sang it terribly actually I do have a funny story about that one time I (laughs) I sang in front of uh, Ryan Tedder uh, lead singer of One Republic and I sang stop and stare actually and (laughs) because I was doing like an audition for for something and um, he was running the audition thing. I sang his song for him. And he's like, oh, that was amazing. Terrible song choice, though. <laughs> he said it jokingly. But I guess technically I could see what people mean. Yeah, that nah, does make a little bit of sense. But for me, I don't know. I, I kind of enjoy that thrill a little bit. It's kind of cool. And I think if you like have the confidence in your rendition, then you're, oh, yeah. you're kind of That's set. A big part yeah. Of I, yeah. I feel like I know what maybe thing you were singing um for, but I think it was another show or like a competition thing. If you're taking requests, I would love to hear uh You Broke Me First, Tate McRae. You've done that on TikTok and Demons by Imagine Dragons as well. 100 percent Yeah, absolutely. Um 
You I'm did trying. do a couple though, because in my blood and before you go were songs that you've covered in the past. So the opportunity Very is sure. out there. And there is a reason for that because I wanted to make sure that they were songs that I would like be able to just know already and could focus on another level of it, like more on the artistry kind of side of it than spending too much time just learning the song. Um, but no, yeah, those those two are really good ones. And especially I think personally for me, Demons by Imagine Dragons. I would love to do an Imagine Dragons song. That would be really cool. When people say you're like a mini Sean Mendez or the next Harry Styles, Justin Bieber, I just saw a comment on YouTube earlier today. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the th- I have been hearing that for a while, uh, since I was like 12. And I've never seen too much of the like, I don't know, comparison. But then again, I really do because I'm a singer and I am, I guess, somewhat look like them. I don't think I really do because they're like, obviously, you know, the heart throbs and I'm not that. But um, whenever it comes to like what kind of fits I want to wear and everything like that, I will definitely say I throw, I get a lot of inspiration from like Justin Bieber, Shawn Mendes, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, especially like, this is going to be weird, but like kind of younger Justin Bieber, but kind of in that midsection where he kind of wore like cool stuff. That's kind of, I guess, boy bandish is what I'm talking about. Although Harry Styles, I don't see at all. I'm not going to lie to you. I can't see the Harry Styles one at all. That dude is completely different vibe. I was going to say with the fashion sense, like the skinny jeans, the high top sneakers is definitely like a younger version of Justin Bieber. I feel like now he just wears a lot of like he has that clothing line where he just has like baggy sweatshirts. Drew, yeah. (laughs) So not not the Drew era, Justin. You're talking about the. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The older one or, or the younger one, I guess. Somewhat younger. How old is Justin Bieber now? That's a good question. Is he 30? No way. No, there's no way. I'm going to go look that up later. Um, (laughs) On on the darker side of social media, like how do you handle criticism and negative comments? Because obviously being in the public eye is kind of opening that up. I am perfectly fine with criticism. Criticism, I, I, even when people are hating, like if people say, oh, this guy is Walmart Sean Mendez. I think I saw that exact comment somewhere. Um, I'm like, yes, true. Agreed. Absolutely. 100%. Um, I don't see like criticism or anything as like, I know a lot of people see it as like haters or something like that. To me, it's not, it's just people's opinion and people are going to be louder with their opinions when they're anonymous on the internet. It's just how it is. I know I'm that way. I know. I think everybody is that way to be honest with you. And it's just, if I hear it in person, if like people are telling me these things in person, if people are coming up to me and you know, telling me, hey, that was really bad. You suck. Then I will take it more seriously. But just hearing like, hearing like, especially whenever it's a minority of people um, saying that, you know, it's terrible or, oh, this, this, this absolutely sucked. It just doesn't really hit me because I understand. It's like, it's not for everybody. So I kind of, I guess kind of ignore it, but I, I take it to some degree of I don't know, criticism. I don't know. It's always been a weird thing for me. I've just never really thought about it too much. I, I just see it as people being being human, having opinions and putting them on the internet. It's fine with me. I like how you kind of phrase that because for you, it's just about the music. So like you mentioned, you know, not everyone has to like it as long as you like what you're making and the people you care about are also there and supportive. That's what counts. Is there a specific area as an artist that you are looking to improve upon or build your skill set? I would say, ooh, ooh, uh, 100% in the songwriting aspect now, I would say is probably where I'm really, because now that I've understood what a connection to like music actually feels like, because before I might have been just doing songs because like maybe I, you know, can sing this certain song well or just have a good tone on it or something like that. But there's a whole other level that I think I was missing for years um, of like artistry and like understanding what that kind of means to me. And I think a lot of that is emotional connection to the song because 
I guess for years I would listen to music because it sounds good, not because it feels right. Like to me, um, now today, if I'm listening to music, it might be because, you know, I'm like about to work out or something like that. And I want to get like hyped up, but ultimately there's like an emotional connection I have with most music I listen to now. Um, if I'm feeling down songs hit me way harder than they did back then. So I want to translate that into my own music and I want to be able to write something that isn't like the alphabet, but you know, just like really bad because <laughs> I used to write songs and I used to be really, really not good at it, but my parents would support me through that. <laughs> Where do you document new ideas for songs? Like, do you have a notebook? Do you write them in your phone and then go home and kind of like piece it all together? So usually it's at three in the morning and usually it's on voice notes on my phone and with my guitar. That's basically what uh, usually it is. Um, emphasis on the three in the morning part. It usually is definitely that because I swear I don't get that inspiration unless I've listened to either listen to something recently where I'm like, this is, this is something really good and I need to replicate something like this or it is just super late and I have a lot of stuff on my mind and I need to write something. That's usually how it is. I don't know if you know Charlie Puth, but he had an album that he released, Absolutely. Voice Notes, and and like it kind of came from that whole idea about yeah, like that's the that was the name of the album, wasn't it? Was that a recent one? I can't remember. It it was probably by now at least four or five years ago, but yeah, I, I just was, remember was that moment. yeah. But no, hundred percent. That is literally exactly what it is. You just put songs on your phone, and like Charlie Puth does this really well because he's able to make these really catchy and cool sounding songs and with his really, 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 really good voice too. But he's able to put like emotional connection into just these catchy songs and everything. And I'm like, dang, that's really cool. And then he has like the whole production element and all that stuff down too. The guy's got an ear for music that not many people have. Yeah, I think so, he has like a music engineering degree. So, I mean, that's something that you oh, yeah. could work towards with that technical side that you are are also mm -hmm. growing. Um, in The Voice, we know that the playoffs are next. And if you make it through that stage, the live shows, I know the playoffs have been filmed. You can't spoil the outcome. But is there anything in general that you can share about what's to come and maybe how you prepared for the next round taking in the coaches' feedback? Yeah, so for the next round, um, I'm going to somewhat try to replicate what I did in the previous round and um but maybe with more stage presence kind of put more of myself into the song without just kind of breaking down on the stage about what the song is about and maybe try to put it in a more controlled manner that can be true to me but still also something performative something entertaining for the audience uh so that is a lot of what you can potentially expect when you choose your songs for like, you know, the blinds and then the knockouts and this round, um, are you always certain of your song choices or is there any indecision after the fact? Honestly, a lot of it is just difficulty trying to figure out what kind of song I would like to do because, and I know I'm not the only person that does this, but you and you can like envision yourself. Maybe, maybe I am the only one that does this, honestly, but you can envision yourself singing a song, right? Like, Especially, and I, I, I've seen comments about this, but like, I remember seeing someone say that feeling where you imagine yourself like singing to your school, like this really emotional song and singing it really well. It's like that dream, basically, but kind of come to life whenever it comes to the voice, because you're kind of doing that and you're doing it on stage too, uh, with TV and all that. So it's kind of that feeling where you're like, man, you look at a song and you listen to it and you're like, you're thinking about everything and the connection you have with it. You're like, if I could do have this exact performance that's in my head with this song. And that's pretty much what I've done for the most part. Um, I will say for before you go for my blind audition, um, that was kind of the case. But at the same time, I don't think I was actually expecting to sing that one originally. Because although you do pick your blind song, it's picked from a list of songs that you make. So it kind of becomes tougher to tell. But yeah, with, um, with, with my knockout song, I definitely 
had that vision for what the song would like see what the song would be like basically so going to your family your a bit of your personal life I wanted to hear about the bond that you shared with your late grandfather because you wear his dog tags as a tribute to him Mm. on the show yeah absolutely um my grandfather was just always like a really really close person to me um he was super funny he always told me crazy stories and all that and i always and this was with my my grandpa and grandma um but i always kind of wanted to show them something on tv and like some something of me kind of because i knew i knew they always knew i was a singer and they always did support me but i don't know if they ever knew i could get to like the level that i did um or do the kind of things that i did and i wish they were both here to see that today i really do um but yeah it it meant a lot for me to be able to just ha- wear that on on all the uh all the episodes i've been on so yeah definitely thank you for sharing that i i think it's really nice that you hold them i guess both close to your heart when you're on stage you know that they're kind of there with you on this journey and your parents have also been a tremendous support for you what can you say about their roles in your life not only as parents but for your career in music so yeah my dad has always been a very hands-on person whenever it comes to my career um he's always like he, he's always been especially whenever i was younger Um, because, you know, obviously you don't want, you know, people to be weird about you being young and being a singer and trying to be somebody on social media. Um, and my dad's always been very helpful with basically everything. Uh, he's taught me a lot of things about how to be a normal human being and not be the weirdo I am. And my mom, on the other hand, she's just always been super supportive. Like where my dad is very, very critical like very, very critical sometimes. My mom is very much like a mom. And she like she she supports pretty much a lot of the stuff I do. But at the same time, there's like solace in that. There's there's good things about that. I am definitely somebody that works a lot better off positive energy usually. Um so to have that is very nice as well. But yeah, it's it's an interesting balance they balance each other out really well because where my dad is more serious, my mom is a little bit like, that's fine. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Like one little note that I did in the song isn't going to ruin the whole song where my dad is like, that killed it. Actually the whole thing actually give up. (laughs) So it's like the good cop, bad cop, bit of tough love to kind of balance it out. But uh, I mean, they're the ones who kind of pushed you out of your comfort zone to when they notice you singing to yourself and playing video games back when I know your dad's helped you write music as well. Um, So shout out to it's Gene and Clayton, I believe. Yes. And um, speaking of video games, you well you don't have it up right now but you had a detective pikachu poster in the background (laughs) of another interview so i wanted to ask if you were a pokemon fan wow what interview would that have been that would have been at the old house too um what what poke sorry can you rephrase the question are you a pokemon fan and if so Mm -hmm. who was your favorite character who was my favorite character from the show universe the whole Pokemon universe. universe it would have just been ash like straight up I think I used to like I, I used to literally shape my personality around ash which is the most embarrassing thing I ever could have said but at the same time I was in middle school so it's somewhat socially acceptable um but I yeah I've been a huge fan of Pokemon my entire life big fan of Pokemon a, a lot of video games to be honest with you but Pokemon good one <laughs> were you part of the Pokemon Go phase fad i think it was like 2016 where everyone was just running around looking yes for i was it. yes i was a little bit um i i remember this distinctly a kid at my school whenever i went to school because that's how long it's been since pokemon go came out it's been like i don't even know how many years six years <clears throat> seven years wow something like that um but a kid at my school had my favorite pokemon which was Growlithe. And I did not have one. And they always shoved it in my face that they had a growl it, and I didn't. <laughs> You're like, so, those are the memories from school. You're like, never again. That's why I can't go to public school. <laughs> exactly. And now I have an Arcanine, 
just saying, which is the evolved form of Growlithe, and I'm chilling. Okay. So if So, that kid is watching, like, yeah, if you're <laughs> watching, there you go. I I'm doing fine. Okay. I got I got Arcanine now. You also had an interest in acting in your early teens. Uh, you mentioned kind of being in LA. Do you still have that Sparkers music your only focus right now? Absolutely. I could see myself going into the acting world as well. I would love for just like to be able to sing and make that full thing full time, basically. But I am not complaining if I can get some acting stuff as well. Um, now, here's the funny thing is I've never trained for acting. Uh, I mean, I maybe shouldn't be saying this in case this negates a resume <laughs> that I can <laughs> that I can make. Um, but I never really trained for acting. I had like a few acting classes that were not that were like one time acting classes that I would do, but I have never really done that whenever I was young. And this was mainly because of my singing. Um, I got basically found by a talent agency in LA, um, that ended up picking me up and I was able to like do a bunch of different acting stuff. So I got a few things there, like, I think only really two or three actual, um, acting jobs but one of them was really cool <laughs> to be fair the drop top ball that was shown i think on was that the battle or the blinds i think it was the battles but um no that was really cool just to see my face in all of targets in america that was pretty pretty cool Yeah, I mean, you were kind of doing, um, you had like commercial auditions, you were signed with, it was like Osbrink, right? So, which, I mean, it still exists right now, like it's a pretty big agency, maybe you should call them up Oh, yeah. and, and see if you can get back on their roster. Well, after COVID, after COVID, a lot of stuff changed because COVID, COVID really killed a lot of stuff. But um, after COVID, I think I, if I recall, I was dropped, although I actually might be wrong about that. I might still be under contract, technically. I don't think so, though. You're like, I haven't heard from them a while, but I haven't actually looked Oh, into well, I it. talked to the, I talked, I talked to the, uh, to the woman that I, that I, particularly worked with her name being Annette um but I don't actually think that that's how it works anymore I'm not entirely sure though but I'm with the voice now so I don't gotta worry about that So you're like, I need to focus on one thing at a time and we'll see after this voice and what happens there. Um, as we kind of round the back half of the interview, you've gained a lot of new supporters from The Voice, but years prior, you had your tan fans. They turned into your weekly live streams. You interacted with them a lot on Twitter. What can you say about your fan base and their dedication? My fan, oh my gosh. So my fans have been watching me and just like supporting me for years and years and years. I used to be on a website called You Now. You know what You Now is, right? Maybe. It's basically like video, like a live streaming platform. But um, I would have a lot of fans from that and people still to this day from You Now. And I've had a lot of periods in my life where I did, didn't post much on social media. I had a lot of those. Um, because social media has always been an interesting thing for me. I've never really taken social media at heart very, like, I've never been able to get my my heart into it exactly. I know a lot of people have a lot of fun on social media. Um, but for me, it's always been kind of like a almost sometimes a chore whenever my whole brain isn't set into that world. Having a lot more friends that are actually on social media now that I can actually know and talk to and support online, that's helped with that a lot. Um But just growing up, not having any friends really and doing homeschool and all that, I never really felt a need to because I would always see on social media other people just, you know, living it up, having the time of their lives, even though I know a lot of it's just the best side of their life that you will see. But even then, it did give me a bit of that FOMO, fear missing out thing that I was like, yeah. But I, I have been doing that a little bit more. Where was I going with this whole thing? Where? What train, where did this train take me? I am lost currently. Where was I, where did I start here with? <laughs> what was the question? Tell me about your fan base and their dedication. <laughs> that, that, gotcha. But I will still see people from my you now that I did way back in the day that still tell me today, I've been watching you since you now. And I'm like, dang. That was like actually seven years ago. And it just baffles me to this day. And I know people, I know a lot of the fans that I've had are from years and years and years ago. And they've stuck with me to this day. 
um, as just the most loyal fans I could ever ask for. And I, yeah, I am super appreciative for all of my fans. It's crazy. We'll give a shout out to, I was on Instagram and there's like at Tanfastic and they post edits and updates about you and your career like multiple times every single day. It is unreal. It really is that. So I actually know that person. They are, they're a super nice person. Um, but basically they, they've been running this, this account for me and I've known about them for a while. Whenever I first saw them though, I freaked out. It was, it's like one of the first fan pages I ever actually had. And I, I am super appreciative of all the edits and all that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty wild though. I was going through your Twitter X, um, because you're not as active now, but you used to tweet about everything, everything you dreams <laughs> about being Patrick oh, no. stump from fall boy. Like, I don't want to hear this. Uh, your sleep schedule, sun chips sweet tea maths tornadoes in oklahoma i mean nothing was off limits for you okay. back when. yes yes but at the same time and i should definitely be more active on twitter although i <laughs> i'm just not for some reason um to be fair i didn't have a lot going on that that was that crazy <laughs> but i guess i can't really say that because now i do have a bunch of things that are going on but i just never tweet much <laughs> so i'm just going to attribute that to being like I don't know. Insanely uh, bored. <laughs> a, a manic state of boredom. <laughs> yeah. Um, before I ask you our final question, signature question, um, just want to congratulate you on everything so far. You've come a long way since a young tanner singing What Hurts the Most at McSwain Theater. Back home, uh, such an adorable cover. Lovely backing band uh, for that performance. Uh, last question, if you could be any ice cream flavor, which would you be and why? So I don't even like pistachio or pecan ice cream, but for some reason, I'm just going to say that. I'm going to say like pecan, what would you call it? Pecan, just pecan ice cream. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why. It just sounds good right now, even though I'm not a big fan of it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Tanner, for taking the time to chat. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been a ton of fun. For all those watching, make sure to catch Tanner on The Voice, new episodes weekly on NBC and CTV. Stay tuned for the music and to see if he continues in the competition. And we will see you next time. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good one.